<laughs> There's so many emotions that are running through my head and I'm trying to sort all of them out. Honestly, that's so good. Okay, so let's see. Farouche is going to quit chess and Gukesh is going to be world champion for 20 years. And Fabiana Caruana will not play a candidates again. And crazy stuff happens at the candidates. No blitz allowed. You know, you play classical <laughs> chess. Hikaru. He has taught me through our matches so many things. I stopped sacrificing as many pieces. Yeah. Try it <laughs> and see what your results are. Hey guys, I'm Greg Mastrider, and today I am honored to present to you my new guest of the podcast, the legendary grandmaster commentator, my, by the way, my favorite chess commentator, streamer, Daniel Naraditsky. Hi, Daniel. Hi, hi, Greg. I feel like I'm uh, pretty bad at responding to introductions uh, because that was, uh, I'm, I'm honored. Uh, I've listened to your podcasts with Fabi and Levon, uh, and I enjoyed them very much. I'm not really a podcast person in general, but uh, I thought that your questions were very thought-provoking, and uh, of course, their answers were great, but it's impossible uh, to do a good podcast without uh, the perfect questions. So super excited to be here. Thanks for reaching out to me and, and the kind words. I'll try to give you a good show. I'm sure you you will give me a good show. Thank you very much for those kind words. Okay, let's start. So just uh, yesterday, the candidates uh, ended, and I, I I'm still taking in everything that happened. Uh, and I know that you were commentating uh, the last round. I watched some parts of it. It was uh, it was a great show. Even Magnus tuned in. It was like all the planet was following this fascinating uh, thriller. Uh, how do you feel about uh, uh, everything that happened? And uh, after having commentated for uh, some time and spent some time following this. Also, you were like a participant of historic events. Uh, what, what are you feeling right now? There's so many emotions that are running through my head and I'm trying to sort all of them out just throughout today. I mean, I spent a lot of today sleeping because yesterday, Hess and I were taught, we were exhausted and a seven hour show is generally exhausting, but yesterday there was that added component of, we had something like 200,000 plus people watching across, across the networks, 50,000 on Twitch. You know, the chat was going a 100 miles a minute. And, you know, I, I am usually very passionate about commentating and delivering a good show to everybody. But yesterday it was uh, uh, it was like one of the bigger performances of my, I felt like I was playing uh, one mm -hmm. of the games. I felt like I was a participant and I was a participant in some way. And I'm, I'm, uh, it was a great honor uh, to be to be a part of this thing. So I just, every single minute uh, to me was important. It was important for me to deliver a good show uh, to the fans of all the players, which can be a hard thing to do. And I'm sure we'll delve into that. Uh, to summarize what I'm feeling right now, I'm, I'm still kind of riding the candidates high. I'm sad, honestly. I'm sad that it's over. Um, it, it was a two week period that mesmerized the entire chess world. All of the net, Reddit, uh, Twitter, YouTube, the only thing that was talked about was the candidates. And honestly, that's so good because we're all tired of some of the stuff that's been rehashed over and over again, you know, cheating and, and the same topic. So I think the candidates came at a great time. I think it was a, a nice real, a reminder to everybody uh, of, of why we're in the chess world, why we love this game and why, you know, rumors that classical chess are dead that have been circulating now for the better part of a decade. That's just getting old. And I don't think anybody really believes that anymore. Um, and I know that might be rich coming from me. Also <laughs> something we can talk about. Yeah. But Greg, honestly, the candidates itself was a fascinating event that is very um, revealing of certain trends within the top level of classical chess, um, of the potential that this young generation has. And I'm going to spend many days and weeks, the chess world is going to spend many days and weeks really just analyzing what happened at the candidates, what the games reveal, the opening trends, and of course, uh, what Gukesh's performance signifies. But it was an incredible experience, an unforgettable one. And we can definitely delve into the individual components here, but I'm I'm euphoric and I just feel so privileged to have had the chance to participate in some way in, in the writing of this of this historical occasion. Wow, I, I second that. Of course, I was not uh, as directly involved as you were, but I made some content about it every day. I recorded actually two videos, one in English and one in Russian for my uh, Russian speaking audience. Wow. And it was it was uh, so fascinating. I like uh, the adrenaline was pumping uh, and I watched the games at night because of the difference in the time zones. <laughs> it was crazy. But let's talk about you. We will talk about uh, some of the issues that you have already mentioned and some of the uh, topics related to your development as 
both a chess player and a chess personality, chess celebrity, chess streamer, commentator, etc., etc. But first of all, uh, let's just a little bit more talk about the candidates because it's such a fascinating topic. Uh, what were your key? Absolutely. What were your key takeaways from this? You said that uh, in some way it might have shaped how you think about the future of chess. Uh, maybe you can uh, uh, explain a little bit more about that. I think I should kind of preface this by saying that, you know, deriving and, and trying to follow trends within the development of classical chess is very difficult and it's fraught with uncertainty. Making grand conclusions on the basis of one term, okay, Farouche, okay, so let's see, Farouche is going to quit chess and Gukesh is going to be world champion for 20 years and Fabiano Caruana will not play a candidate again. I mean, I see all these people throwing out all these just big statements and this was one tournament. Um, Fabiano is not 68 years old. Okay, uh, no retirement home is going to take him in. He'll probably play the next candidates and will have a great chance to win it. Uh, so uh, we need to really just put things in their proper context. With that said, um, the candidates does reveal, I think, certain tendencies, especially if you take into account previous tournaments like the Tata Steel and tournaments from the last few years uh, since sort of over the board chess has come back. Um, what big... Uh, big things stand out to me, and this will be far from comprehensive, so I'll just kind of throw out uh, one or two things that are coming to my mind right now. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, you you know this, Greg. I wrote a long Reddit post uh, randomly yeah. on my phone. I couldn't fall asleep. I took out my phone, and um, I was going to write three or four sentences on why I think it's impossible to predict the candidates. This was about a week before it began. So I kept writing and writing. I'd never written a, a Reddit post that long, much less on my phone. But I was just, I got so passionate about getting my thoughts out that it turned into like a 10 paragraph post and it was pretty well received. Some people basically said, okay, typical Naroditsky, 10 paragraphs, you said nothing. I think in light of what happened at the candidates, I'm actually pretty proud of that. So Greg, maybe I can pause here for a second and should I kind of outline what I said in two sentences, not in 10 paragraphs? Yeah, sure. Uh, in that post, I think that'll be pretty germane to my thoughts now. Now, I'm not saying this to, to pat myself on the back. I, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, essentially, I said that predicting the results of the candidates is essentially both impossible and largely futile. Um, and and I didn't say this from the perspective of being the, you know, the, the sourpuss in the room. Like, oh, you know, we shouldn't talk about who's going to win. It is fun to try to predict a winner. But realistically, um, I brought to the table an interesting trend, which is that in 2013 at the London Candidates, Magnus won. That is how he qualified to the World Championship, where he remained for 10 years. Since that time, no, in no other candidates has the top seed, the highest rated player coming in, uh, turned out to win the candidates. 2014 uh, Berlin, obviously, uh, in the previous candidates in Madrid. At some point, Levon Aronian, I think in the Berlin candidates, was 28-30 coming in and finished near the bottom of the tournament standings. And that's like, what, five or six candidates tournaments, which reveals kind of an interesting trend. Uh, so I mentioned that because a lot of people were saying that Fabiano is basically a, a lock uh, going into the candidates. He is my favorite player. I love Fabi. Uh, this wasn't like a personal attack, but I just said, we need to dial this back a little bit because the playing strengths of the players are so similar. Fabi could be 2,800 today and 2,770 tomorrow and vice versa for Hikaru or Nepo. You know, so, so I think that people were jumping the gun in large part. But the other thing I talked about is that of the Indian players, I mentioned that I thought Gukesh has the best objective chance to win. And I spent a few paragraphs talking about why I thought that was the case. And we'll discuss Gukesh separately, I think. Um, and I concluded by saying CSHAC, crazy, fill in the blank, crazy stuff happens at the candidate. So I just wanted people to realize that uh, it's very, very difficult to predict the narrative of the candidates. A lot is going to depend on individual games, uh, individual moments, and uh, essentially anybody except Abbasov can realistically win this tournament. Um, the, the younger generation has certain pros and cons to them. The older generation maybe has more experience, uh, but perhaps less kind of energy to their play. Uh, they bring less to the table in the opening or maybe more to the table in the case of Jan. So Again, trying to come up with these trends before the tournament uh, is is largely futile. Does that summary kind of make make sense? And, and should I continue? Am I am I going too deeply into into my thoughts? Absolutely, no. I I I would like you to go even deeper. Continue, please. So as the candidates was going down, I was right there with you. I was on the edge of my seat when I was commentating. Um, the days I wasn't commentating, sometimes I slept through a few a few hours. I'll be honest. 
again, and people can look at that negatively, but the I can't. We were Hess and I, uh, Leko, everybody. After we finished the show, we close our eyes. We all put our head on the desk. Like you're not blinking for seven hours, essentially. Um, but every round, I was just that Gukesh Faruja time scramble that Gukesh lost. Um, I said during the show that I almost had tears in my eyes and people might have been rolling their eyes. No. I mean, you look at Gukesh, you know, you look at him putting his hand in his hands. And if you're not feeling that, you know, those butterflies in your stomach, then, you know, then you've got no empathy. You know, just just seeing that pain um, and seeing how a teenager handled that pain is just honestly com completely mind blowing uh, the way that he bounced back from from that loss. Uh, so Gukesh's play, I, I only have, you know, the, the most positive things to say, and maybe even more important was his ability to handle pressure, uh, because that is a huge indication of his potential to fight for the world championship title, because a lot of players arguably throughout chess history have had the playing strength potential to become world champion, but you couldn't handle the pressure um, or couldn't handle the length of it. Um, 14 rounds, right? That's the longest tournament of any tournament on the circuit. And one point that I made in, in the Reddit post is that Tata Steel is 13 rounds. So that is the best indication we have uh, of the player's resilience. And it's not a good indication, it's one tournament, but Gukesh did great in Tata Steel. He was runner up. He lost the tiebreaker, I think, to Wei Yi, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. All right. Um, and, or did he win it? Yeah, so, so he started badly, bounced back, Right, sound familiar. So he bounced back after a very difficult loss with White to Dingley Ren. And uh, he won three games in a row at some point. And in this tournament, we saw that resilience on full display. His last two rounds uh, really made a huge impression on me because that time scramble, second time scramble against Faruja, uh, where he demonstrates, you know, to say to call that Magnus like, I think is is an understatement. That was literally perfectly done from the moment that Faruja offered that queen trade with queen g6. Mm -hmm. And then in the final round, uh, to play black against Ikaru Nakamura, I don't know how he slept uh, for a single minute on that night. Clearly he did, because he came to the board, he was completely calm, and he played like a chess professional with decades of experience. He completely shut Hikaru down. So there are a lot of very encouraging signs uh, for Gukesh, apart from the fact that he won the candidates and has a chance at the chess there. And I'm talking... Uh, longer term, does Gukesh have a chance to become the next Magnus to, to win the title and hold on to it? I don't think he's anywhere near Magnus's level yet. Um, I think that there are things for him to work on, and that's part of uh, the job of his team. But it's uh, it's very very encouraging what we're seeing from from Gukesh, who's only seventeen. And then there's a lot of other interesting things to discuss, like Ali Reza Faruja and his future. I have a bit of an unconventional take on that. Uh, of course, Fabi and Jan, will they bounce back? Uh, are they getting fatigued? Are they getting tired of the grind? Or will we see Fabi strike back at the next candidates? I think he's got a great shot, by the way. And, you know, for Hikaru, uh, same question. I is he tired of the grind? Is he going to settle down and, uh, you know, chill at home? Or will he try one more time? I mean, how close did he come to become world champion? And how unthinkable would that be four years ago when everybody was... Uh, Already, you know, essentially writing his grave, his grave site and saying, you know, rest in peace, that's it. Hikaru's classical career is over. Chess fans have a way of doing two things that can, uh, I think, really belie the coincidental, the non-deterministic nature of, of the development of the chess world. They can make grand conclusions based on one tournament. I already talked about that. Um, and, you know, sometimes they just jump the gun and, and, uh, make make all of these assumptions, like the assumption that Hikaru doesn't train classical chess, which he most certainly does, uh, or that one player is more motivated or less motivated. Uh, but the reality is, right now, we do not see a clear favorite in terms of playing strength. We have this huge group of super GMs that includes the younger generation and the older generation, and they're almost all equivalent in strength. And I don't remember the last time that we had this because we essentially had the Magnus era, and before the Magnus era, we had... Um, more of what we see now, but not quite. We did have that clear group of favorites, Anand, Kramnik, you know, Topalov, and then the players who were uh, just, you know, breathing down their necks, but didn't quite reach to their level. So this is really the first time where we have this fascinating pack of players, and it's absolutely unclear who is going to emerge and, and who, if anyone, is going to build a chess dynasty uh, in Magnus's style in, in the next decade. I think it won't be... Anyone, Gukesh has a chance, but I think likelier than not, we will see this free-for-all Hunger Games-style situation 
where we don't see a, you know, a Jeopardy champion for 70 days kind of thing. Wow, you have uh, raised so many exciting topics. And so this just goes to show how many uh, crazy story arcs, character development arcs are going yep. on in chess right now. Uh, you you didn't do mention- openings too, by the way, are fascinating. We can, t- we can talk about that whenever you want. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, let, 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 let's talk about uh, some of this stuff more. Uh, I wanted to say that we even uh, didn't get to mention some players who are not in the candidates, but are still among this new group of the super elite, like mm-hmm. Abdus Satorov, for example, who is currently, I guess, number five in the world rankings and who could also be one of the future Eric Icy. Mm-hmm. contenders. Uh, Eric Icy, who is top 10 currently. So this is this is crazy. Really so many interesting topics to delve into. So let's, let's try to cover at least the, the most uh, exciting ones uh, or the, the, the ones that first come to mind. Let's discuss Gukesh. But first, you said you had a contrarian take on Alireza. What do you think about him? So I will admit that I'm 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 fond of Alireza and I'm a little bit biased in the sense that he gets, listen, uh, he has tremendous, the weight of expectations is a very, very difficult way to manage. Um, and people do this weird thing, first of all, where, where Gukesh is 17 and uh, he, he just recently learned how to zip his pants up, but somehow Ali Reza is old and washed and, you know, needs to be checked for arthritis. Like, Ali Reza is 20, Gukesh is 17, that's a three-year difference. People start college sometimes at age 20. People really need to relax with this whole old and washed narrative. I've also seen a lot of chess fans saying Ali Reza's played two candidates already. I mean, it, time has come for him to win a candidates tournament. I mean, geez, how many times can you try at this easy tournament before you can actually win? So I'm not saying that Ali Reza is performing to his expectations or that, you know, we shouldn't, you know, Ali Reza fans shouldn't be disappointed uh, in, in the arc of his career. Of course, they should. And he has in some ways disappointed after he crossed 2,800, I think. You'd be hard pressed to find a title player or uh, just a regular chess fan who didn't think that this was the next Magnus. I mean, you had Magnus himself saying he wouldn't play anybody but Ferruja. What other endorsement uh, do you need of potential? But with full due respect to Magnus, the fact that even he cannot even come close to predicting who is going to succeed and who is going to fall um, just tells us that there is no way to predict it because we just do not know the trends, they're too complex for us to understand before they happen. The trends that drive up some young players and cause others to kind of enter that 2730 to 2770 swampland. Um, as far as Ferruja goes, I think people are really jumping the gun. He's had a difficult, uh, difficult period. It's not entirely clear what his level of investment is, right? And I wouldn't conclude that there's no level of investment. I mean, look at how hard he tried to get into the candidates. Now, was it like the most ethical thing? That's a separate debate to be had. I don't care about that. It's the fact that he went the extra mile and he operated within the rules. Um, the fact that he played the candidates. I mean, if there was a lack of motivation and investment, you, you don't subject yourself to the pressures of the candidates. That would be a crazy thing to do if you didn't like chess and you weren't interested in pursuing the world title. So that's there's no evidence uh, to, to, to make that conclusion. But with that said, I think that he's got more serious psychological problems than the other young players. Um, I think nerves, it, after two candidates, it's reasonable to conclude that that he's got some issues on that front. Uh, maybe an issue with uh, playing too many commentators and too many bullet matches. Uh, of course, that's a meme that I think is t- it's time to retire that. I myself uh, harped on that throughout the, broad ca- throughout the uh, candidates. But I think the statute of limitations in that uh, is going to hopefully going to pass eventually. Um, but I'm not overreacting. I think Ali Reza will be back in the next candidates. And while I think he's got bigger problems that he needs to sort out, my firm belief is that he's got the talent level uh, to, to challenge Magnus's level if he figures cer- certain things out. He's got the kind of that energy in his play and the opening preparation from him was very disappointing this tournament. He really didn't show anything exciting in the opening. He had a bunch of inexplicable mistakes that break down against Hikaru Nakamura early on. And in uh, the final few rounds, right, he did this weird thing twice where against Hikaru, that topsy-turvy game with the two pieces against a rook, he makes move 40 and then blitzes out a horrible blunder like on move 41 or 42. He did the exact same thing with Gukesh. Uh, with with this move queen to g6. And I basically yelled at him during the broadcast because I was mad because that's just, it's just stupid. And 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 that should never happen at that level. 
Now, if he would have thought for 10 minutes and played queen g6, no, no issues. It's not the mistake itself I was criticizing. It's, it's the carelessness of taking time in a moment that's clearly very, very important. So he has to sort those things out. I'm not going to speculate on sort of his family situation. There was that drama with his dad. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm perhaps just more of a softie than some chess fans. But when I see that, I, I just wish Ali Reza and his family the best. I just hope his home environment uh, is, is conducive to chess development. And if it's not, uh, my sympathies are with him. You know, to change your country, uh, to learn a new language, uh, something that people don't talk about. Come on. I mean, these people, were you never 20 years old? Did you never face adversity in your life? And if you did... Um, would you like the community at large to be sympathetic or would you like the community at large to be to dunk on you and, and you know, just to, to, to accuse you of not putting in enough effort? I really think that people take it too harshly on Ali Reza. And, and I, I wish that they saw things in, in larger context. We should wait at least another candidate cycle before we start making conclusions about Ali Reza being uh, kind of in the past. I, I just don't see enough evidence of that just yet. Yeah, I think it's it's a huge uh, uh, overstatement to say that uh, anyone's career is over when he or she is just 20 years old and uh, uh, already <laughs> demonstrated uh, crazily good results. So yeah, I'm also hoping for a bounce back from Alireza and uh, definitely he's, uh, he's got some psychological stuff to work on. Maybe we could uh, delve into chess psychology a little bit later in this podcast because also it's one of the topics mm -hmm. that fascinates me. Um, and also as a chess player who has returned to active uh, tournament play, <laughs> I, I now can sympathize with many of the stuff that's going on. Also, you mentioned uh, Gukesh uh, with his head in, in his hands uh, while making this uh, time pressure uh, blunders. This is <laughs> absolutely something that's heartbreaking for any uh, person with empathy, but especially for any chess player who has mm -hmm. experienced the same stupid stuff in his uh, or her games. Uh, you mentioned uh, Fabi uh, being uh, also a li likely contender in the upcoming cycles. Uh, do you think mm -hmm. that uh, in those cycles, uh, the winner of them will face the new world chess champion, Gukesh Domarajo? <laughs> so you're asking me for my world title prediction. Yeah. In Gukesh versus Ding, which, first of all, I think as, as of the time of recording, we basically have confirmation that Ding will, in fact, play. I don't November. know where that rumor came from that he's not going to play in November, but I mean, it, it, just because, again, it's the same thing. Just because it happened once and now it's happened twice with Bobby Fischer, it's, it's not a trend. You know, uh, there's this expression, I always forget how it goes, like once a coincidence, like two a tendency, three times a trend. But OK, more often than not, the world champion has shown up throughout chess history to defend their title. Um, so the huge question, obviously, and you don't need an, a Naroditsky to say this, is that the, the big X factor will be Ding's mental state on in his emotional state. The things that he's been dealing with, uh, we don't know what they are. And we don't know if they're sort of physical in nature, mental in nature. I didn't read his, his latest interview. Uh, whatever they are, it doesn't matter. First of all, obviously, hopefully the chess community can unite to wish uh, him the best and to hope that the best version of Ding shows up at the, at the World Championship match. I don't think Gukesh would want to play Ding, uh, a weakened Ding, who forces himself to play um, I, in fact, I'm positive that Gukesh himself would, would the first thing he would say is, no, I, I want to win the title against someone who plays his full strength. So if we can see a full strength ding, the kind of ding that crossed 2800, the ding that people have largely forgotten about, right? People have somehow, I think, sometimes think that ding some accidentally made it to where he was mm -hmm. because there's this recency bias and I totally get it. Um, can you name, for example, a tournament that ding won? Just period. I mean, I... I, I would think, have accepted the World Championship match against Nepo. I think he won in the finals against Magnus in uh, St. Louis in 2019. Excellent. <laughs> That's what I remember. <laughs> and I, I ask this not disparagingly, but the opposite. That's what I also remember, that final rapid game against Carlsen. Um, but if you look at Ding, I mean, he was I'm on his FIDE page right now. And in 2018, September, he crossed 2800 for the first time. Um, and, and 2018, September, that was like a different a different universe, a different millennium. Mm -hmm. um, people don't really remember that time. But if you just click on a random uh, supplement from that time, World Olympia 2018, here's how he did. He beat a 2600, he beat a 2700. He made three draws, including one against Mamidyarov, who was 2820. 
defeated Jan Krzysztof Duda and drew 28-30 Caruana. Then, European Club Cup. He defeated Peter Svidler 27-50, Drew Magnus defeated a 26-50, he beat a 2500. I mean, yes, that guy was and still is very good at chess. In Norway Chess 2019, he had another solid showing, didn't lose a single game, defeated Fabi and defeated Mamed Yarov. So Ding, at his peak, is an incredibly solid player, also defeated Gukesh in the last Tata Steel tournament where Ding had yeah. that breakdown. But uh, at first, everybody thought Ding is back and he beat Gukesh with black. So Gukesh has some personal things to, to kind of work through there. If the best version of Ding shows up, I think that you essentially have two players with pretty similar styles, uh, which is which are styles sort of in the Magnus general Magnus Carlsen camp, sort of more positional at their core than tactical. Um, opening preparation, I think, will play a very large role in, in this match because Ding with white uh, cannot, I think, afford uh, to come with the same kind of vanilla setups that he did against Jan. You know, the H3, yeah. Queen's Gambit declines. Ding has to put more pressure. We saw how Gukesh reacts uh, for example, in the last round against Hikaru, if you don't put pressure on Gukesh out of the opening, um, he is going to outplay you. He, he is going to hold the line and he is not going to self-destruct, uh, which, which is a huge strength. Uh, so opening prep will be fascinating to observe in that match. I would say it's very hard to make a prediction because I we truly have no idea what kind of form Ding is going to be. And if he demonstrates the same form that he did against Jan, I think that Gukesh is the favorite. If Ding can improve his opening preparation with White, if he can avoid time pressure and perhaps use Gukesh's time pressure against him, and I do think that time management could be, insofar as we could point out some things that Gukesh might want to work on, uh, mm -hmm. not suggesting that I, uh, I mean, it, it is my business or even right to point that out, but things that I observed at the candidates, at least, the time management uh, of the players will be interesting to watch. I would say Gukesh is the slight favorite as I currently see it, with the big caveat that uh, almost everything depends on Ding's mental and emotional preparation. Uh, and I truly hope that in the next you know, seven months, uh, he can get himself uh, to a place where he feels motivated to play the world championship. And first and foremost, of course, uh, I wish him the very best of health. That, that is by far more important than you know, anything chess related. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I also wish uh, uh, to see Din uh, in his uh, top form. Uh, you remember he also holds uh, like number two uh, place for the longest uh, streak of unbeaten games, mm -hmm. 100 or something like that. Games without a single loss against uh, great players, top, top level chess players. So if we see Din is in such shape, it could be very, very difficult for Gukesh. But let's let's speak about Gukesh because he is, of course, a sensation. Uh, nowadays, everybody mm -hmm. is discussing him and many people, especially, you know, that uh, most of your audience, most of my audience uh, are not uh, very deeply uh, informed about all the intricacies of uh, uh, styles of all uh, uh, strong chess players, especially uh, if uh, this chess player's name is not Magnus Carlsen or like Fabio or mm -hmm. someone who was uh, who was more heavily discussed. Uh, Gukesh wasn't uh, on the radar of most people who watch us currently before these candidates. Probably Indian fans, yes, they uh, they followed him and they rooted for him, but uh, not many people uh, even believe that he is the new the new goat. And now many people say that he has played in the second half, especially of the candidates, like a freaking computer, like like uh, the new Magnus, or maybe even better. So what what is it? What what's what's this uh, recipe? What's this? Uh, Secret ingredient that makes him so strong. How come he uh, outclassed his opposition in such a dominant fashion in some games? Well, that's the big question, and I, I'm not going to pretend to have the, the clear answers. But uh, I also, you know, the, the thing that people have to understand is that I'm I'm in touch with classical with with top level classical chess and commentate a lot of the tournaments, but I don't perform systematic analyses of all of the games in the tournament. It's not like if there's a random. Certain tournaments I don't follow at all because I just lose interest and I'm as bored as the next guy over like Fisher Random. I'm a mm -hmm. big, uh, if I'm a Fisher Random hater. Mm -hmm. And and that, you know, Fisher Random tournament, it was well organized props to the, I didn't watch a single game. Some tournaments, I just find it hard to get motivated and to get excited about them. Uh, so just having, having said that, 
Uh, Gukesh first came on my radar uh, when he became a GM, which I think was 2020, four years ago, which is, yeah, at 13. He was one of the youngest GMs in history. And I noticed him, I think, in a tournament in Gibraltar. I looked at some of his games and really was struck by um, the fact that he's sort of like the OG new prodigy with a capital N. In the old days, when a prodigy came about, he was invariably tactical. And there was like, even Ferruja, right? He won his games in this explosive style. He played the Night Orf. When you watch Kukesh's games from 2020, he's he's positional. I mean, when you look at his games and don't know his age, you would bet a silver dollar that he's at least, you know, like 25. Mm -hmm. uh, Because this guy is outplaying like adult GMs in positional fashion. But he can also calculate really well. And if things get tactical, uh, he can hold the line. and, and, And he does a good job of stabilizing the position. He knows his openings. And I was like, man, this is this guy could become really, really good. At the same time, you have to understand that just because someone becomes a GM at 13 or 14, it doesn't itself mean that they're going to be 2750. And more often than not, you know, a lot of these players still have a lot to prove. Abhimanyu Mishra, uh, super exciting. Sam Sevian, um, who's I'm a big fan of him, but he hasn't managed to make that extra step. Jeffrey Zhang, like some of the American mm-hmm. talent that became GMs very early at, at 14, 15. It, it's not a guarantee uh, that you're going to cross 27 to 50. But in Gukesh's case, he had this giant leap. Uh, so looking at his rating history, he, he uh, is 2599, 2021 September. 2022 September supplement, he's 2726. Wow. So that's like, Hans Niemann-esque, you know, that, yeah. that's that's <laughs> insane. But a lot of players, when they cross 2,700, they have this dip back to like, you know, the 2,680 swamp. This has happened a lot with players of various ages. You know, my friend Sam Shanklin had this happen. Mm-hmm. He hit 2,730, dropped back, went back up. Uh, vid it. You know, a lot of players can't stabilize for whatever reason. It's so easy. It must be so easy to stabilize on 2,730. Gukesh did. And since that time... He dropped to 2718, but he has largely displayed 2750 level, which is pretty incredible. And consistency uh, is so important now. Gukesh rarely has just like massive, uh, massive failures. He, he rarely has like a fiasco at a particular tournament. And that consistency and solid performance, even when his form is not the best, is uh, to me, incredibly important. Um, of course, his ability to handle pressure. He's got like the full psychological package on top of everything he demonstrates on the board. But Greg, I think a big reason, I, I just wanted to make this point. I think a big reason that he wasn't on people's radar uh, is because he doesn't play online. And and mm-hmm. I think this is kind of a hidden uh, driver of why it seems there's this weird thing where some players are talked about all the time and others aren't. Um, I think it's online presence. That's a big part of it. Uh, like if you take Vidit, for example, you know, Vidit is, is honestly, all of the Indian players, I have yeah. to say, are without exception, are so classy and so nice. Prague, Vidit, even the, the quote unquote Lords, Nihal, Raunak. Uh, so just a huge shout out to uh, the culture, uh, you know, of the, of the fans and, and, the, and the parents uh, who, who always do a great job. I'm a big fan uh, and makes it makes them easy to root for. Uh, but someone like Nihal or um, or Vidit, they have a bigger online footprint. Nihal plays on chess.com all the time. Uh, you know, Vidit is on YouTube and talking to Anish and tweeting. Uh, and even someone like Prague, I think, has just more mentions online. Gukesh has never played just casual blitz on chess.com. He, he, he never plays. He takes chess seriously. This guy is the OG chess professional. Um, and almost all players... Even the ones who don't play as actively online nowadays, they had a phase where they got addicted to chess.com. And Ali Reza, of course, uh, is the poster child of this. But Gukesh never really played Blitz online. He's not a, you know, he's not a bad Blitz player, but that's not how he built up his career. And maybe it's that old school Soviet approach, like no Blitz allowed. You know, you play classical <laughs> chess from time you are 11 years old. Uh, one Blitz game per year maximum. That, I think, maybe has contributed to this incredible depth and class that you see uh, at, at his age. So, you know, to me, can we say that Gukesh is clearly better than the other juniors like Abdul Satorov uh, and even his compatriots, Eric Geisi and Prague? I don't think we can conclude that yet. I think it's very, very hard to say. So we need to give that a couple of years. But man, in terms of like his ability to control the game and his ability to play like Magnus Carlsen, right? Similarity to Magnus Carlsen, 
with Gukesh, I think you've got a resemblance there. And, and I think he's moving in that direction for sure. Yeah, it will be very exciting to follow his uh, path. I, I, uh, I'm pretty sure that he will become the world champion, uh, but we will see. Uh, not necessarily this time, by the way. Yes, if we see the the, the renewed Dean, uh, but definitely uh, I'll be following all his games from now on. Um, you mentioned another controversial and really exciting topic: the relation of your uh, blitz online blitz uh, performances uh, to your classical chess level. And it's been discussed uh, since uh, prehistoric era, I think. I've recently read a book about yep. bronze scene uh, by Gena Sasonka, and there uh, he describes uh, uh, the attitude of Bronstein, who, for those who don't know, was the World Chess Championship challenger and almost beat B Botvinnik in their title match in the 1950s. Uh, they ended up uh, they ended to the match ended in a draw, uh, and Botvinnik retained the title, but he was this close to the title. Also succumbed to the psychological pressure in the couple of the last rounds and did not win. So Bronstein uh, insists that you should play uh, as much blitz as possible to uh, be fluent in your openings, in uh, some plans. My schemes. guy, yeah. my guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, another player who is uh, more well-known uh, currently is Hikaru Nakamura, who also probably has uh, shown that playing a lot of online blitz can have a good impact on your classical. So what's your attitude towards that? I know that you are uh, not just a practitioner uh, of blitz and uh, a very successful one, one of the best uh, speed chess players uh, worldwide, but you are also a theoretician. I've read your essays about uh, blitz improvement on chess.com on, on your blog several years ago. So I know that you have a lot to say about this. Definitely. I mean, the, the and, and to be clear about, you know, definitions, I mean, blitz nowadays is basically three plus zero online and three plus two over the board. Uh, but we can we can lump, you know, we can talk about bullets separately. But but five minute chess, uh, we're talking about just just speed chess in general. Uh, and and I have been passionate about blitz essentially since I got access to a computer, which at first was restricted by my dad. I got, you know, uh, X number of hours per week. But uh, I got an account at the Internet Chess Club which, you know, maybe some viewers will, will remember ICC. This was uh, basically, you know, where, where dinosaurs played Blitz. Um, it, it has existed since the late 90s. And I got an account there in 2003. 2003, at eight years old, my, my dad registered me. I was rated uh, 1,500 at the time. And, and off I went. I, I just knew it was love at first sight. Um, I had to be pulled away from the computer those first few years. Like, it's it's curfew time. The computer literally had to be taken away from me mid-game. And sometimes uh, I'll admit that uh, this happened all through high school. Uh, even when I had my own laptop, I would be doing homework in my room after school. And of course, I'd pull up chess.com or ICC. I'd start playing a game. And uh, as the day would turn to, to the evening, if my mom walked in or my dad walked into to my room, uh, the chessboard, of course, would reflect on my window uh, on my window, uh, especially when it was dark and they could see that I wasn't doing my homework. So I would have to quickly switch tabs. Um, but not because I was doing something nefarious because I was just playing, <laughs> I was just playing blitz and, um, I knew that my addiction was out of control. Uh, so for me, blitz is, is a love. I, I love blitz so, so much. I can never see myself stop playing it. Um, and that's where I come from in so far as, you know, the question of do you need, is Blitz a necessary condition uh, to improve a classical and sort of the modern era? Or is it a necessary condition to limit or perhaps exclude uh, regular Blitz chess? I think it's neither. I, I don't think Blitz inherently helps or hurts your classical development. I think it depends entirely on what your sort of stylistic uh, profile looks like and uh, to what extent Blitz is hurting your ability to train uh, and to do classical specific training. Of course, like this question, Greg, I think is, is inextricably linked to the bigger question of uh, to what degree are Blitz and classical similar? To what degree is the skill set? And of course, then we're getting into some other interesting topics, <laughs> which we can uh, avoid getting into them directly. Uh, but, but the larger philosophical question of like, is Blitz and classical ultimately the same game? Uh, like when you draw the Venn diagram, right, Blitz, Classical, and then the skills that are interlinked. Of course, the rules of the game are the same. Um, people understand that there are major differences, but are the similarities 
Uh, do the similarities outweigh the differences? And my answer to this question is, well, I think that Blitz and Classical are extremely different games. And from my perspective, the fact that there is a large gap, for example, in my Blitz level and my Classical level, and a lot is made of that. You know, a lot of people um, make this point to illustrate one of several things. And I'm not saying this from the perspective of self-defense. You know, no, no, that doesn't interest me at all. Um, we kind of agreed to uh, avoid this topic. And if you think it's important, I'm happy to broach it. Uh, the, the topic, of, of course, of cheating and, and paranoia. But to me, uh, it's completely natural that a lot of players and uh, particularly a lot of GMs will have a gap between their blitz level and their classical level, which is, I think, pretty easily explained by a couple of factors. Um, and I promise that this will eventually tie into my answer of um, does blitz help or hurt the development of perhaps the top players? Of course, um, there is the factor of time, which is crucial. And that defines like a large percentage of the games, which you would lose in a classical game with increment. But because it's a blitz game, your decisions change completely. For instance, I might go into an end game that I know is losing um, in a classical game, but in blitz, it's easily winning because your opponent has 30 seconds, you have one minute. Or I might sacrifice a piece because I know there's no way my opponent is going to figure out the complications. I cannot emphasize enough the extent to which that changes the game. Your entire pattern of decision making as a good blitz player is tied into the clock situation all the time. And in a classical game, this is true like throughout 5% of the game, maybe just in the time pressure stage and even not really then because you're going to make time control and you can't re rely entirely on the clock. Then, of course, there is the oversized factor of uh, short calculation. I think that the short calculation is perhaps the single most important, along with pattern recognition and seeing quick tactics, is the single most important skill in Blitz and particularly in Bullet. I'm talking calculation of variations two to three moves in length. Mm -hmm. um, in classical chess, of course, that is extremely important, but in classical, things are predicated much more on deeper calculation. Um, and pausing at the right moment for five to 10 minutes and calculating a wider range of variations. Whereas in Blitz, just short but accurate calculation, perhaps which is the talent that I have, and the talent that I've kind of built uh, a lot of my classical career off of uh, becomes incredibly important. Uh, deep positional reasoning uh, in classical is, is crucial, you know, making these, these small but significant positional decisions, uh, such as Gukesh playing with like B4. Right in the last mm -hmm. round against Hikaru, yeah. and and people can Great you can move. project this on the screen when we put out, yeah, amazing move, uh, such a move which no, no, not preparation I think because he thought for, he uh, for some quite time, some yeah. time on the previous move on mm -hmm. the previous move he thought for fifteen minutes, still preparation or not such a deep approach to the position in a blitz game doesn't matter at all you play before you don't play before these these small opening decisions or decisions in the early middle game do not matter one whit. You can play bishop b7 or knight c6 because neither player has nor the time uh, nor the ability to exploit any of these subtle mistakes. Uh, and that is why just trying to predicate your, your classical training on playing tons of blitz and learning, you know, using it to learn openings or get better at tactics. I mean, it helps to a narrow degree, but to a, to a large extent, you know, the type of training you have to do to improve uh, these deeper 2,700 plus skills are completely different. Um, so, so playing a lot of Blitz, I don't think it necessarily hurts. It'll hurt if you play all day, every day. I think it creates over time a more superficial um, surface level approach to the game. That's totally true. And I think this is one of my big problems when I do play classical and I don't really play classical anymore, but uh, this has been a problem throughout my career. Yes, uh, the fact that I can just impulsively make a decision not that I'm literally necessarily going to play too fast, but sometimes I, I'm so used to thinking of the position in blitz terms uh, that penetrating the surface layer becomes more difficult. And for top players, this is especially important, uh, which is why you see, you know, let's name this new generation, Noterbeck, Gukesh, um, Arjun Aragaisi, you know, maybe even Pragnananda, uh, Faruja, of course, perhaps is the exception, although he doesn't play much anymore. None of those players play a lot online. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll play a title Tuesday here and there. They'll play a blitz session here and there. All of them keep the amount of blitz that they play uh, under wraps. And even Hikaru, you know, he plays a lot of blitz, but Hikaru is a, uh, as we say in Russian, unikum. Like he, he is 
one man in the entire world out of the 8 billion people we have living on this earth, or however many there are, um, and people constantly referencing Hikaru as an example of anything, uh, that's automatically invalid. Uh, he is like a man with four arms. He is like, uh, you know, the only person in the world who possesses X skill. Hikaru is different from everybody, and we need to stop, I think, as a chess community saying, well, well, but about, what about Hikaru? Like, how can he ma make it happen? Hikaru is just someone who I have not seen an example of a player like him with his tendencies and his abilities uh, not just to juggle everything that he does, but to demonstrate the skill that he does uh, in classical and blitz throughout his career. There is nobody like him, and 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 trying to model your path of improvement on Hikaru is is impossible. So, uh, to to summarize, Greg, I think blitz is its own game. Uh, the differences in skill set are vast, which doesn't make it surprising at all to me uh, that in the sphere of online chess there are many of these quote unquote outliers. Um, and I think, frankly, it's ridiculous that people might look on this differently. Um, anybody with chess experience realizes that at his heart. And of course, there's the question of OTB blitz versus online blitz, separate topic as well. Uh, but no, I don't think blitz is the path to serious improvement at the 2700 level, which doesn't mean I'm going to play any less of it. Um, <laughs> and it doesn't mean it doesn't have a narrow range of helpful uh, of, of things that it helps with. I, I don't know if that answer is coherent in any way. I'm sorry if I'm uh, going off on too many tangents. It's just, these questions are so interesting and, and I sometimes can't even decide what I wanna, what I wanna talk about, what I wanna say. Yeah, great, great response. It's, as they say, I think, multifaceted, right, uh, topic. Uh, so with many, yep. uh, many, many aspects. Uh, so uh, yeah, it could take us a whole another podcast to discuss. A uh, couple of remarks from my side. First of all, uh, yeah, we we will skip the topic of cheating today because I am a little bit tired of discussing it <laughs> for <laughs> everyone. We're all hungover <laughs> from this. Yeah, for everyone we, yeah, interested, you, you can check out. We need to give it some time. <laughs> yeah, you can check out my podcasts with Jan Pomnishi on this channel or with Fabiano Caruano, Livona Ronian, and they have uh, uh, extensively discussed this. And I'm also hoping response for from Kramnik uh, to make one with him. I know he's a controversial figure, but I, I I'm sure that we we need to give him voice also to 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 to, to discuss. And also, I, I'd like to challenge some of his assumptions in our podcast. So looking forward to that. With you, I'd like to focus more on uh, on the topics that bring us more joy. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Blitz, uh, you are, well, definitely one of the best in the world in that. Uh, and I wanted to ask you whether you have any, like, Blitz improvement routines, Blitz improvement uh, uh, plans for your self-development in this area, because uh, you are mostly focused uh, uh, on playing this uh, kind of uh, time format uh, nowadays. And uh, it seems that mm -hmm. many people, like yourself, uh, have made a whole career uh, focusing on Blitz and uh, sometimes even neglecting completely classical chess or playing very rarely. So mm -hmm. uh, I assume that you uh, also have some training uh, uh, routine for your Blitz mm -hmm. improvement or something like that, or maybe you're just a genius and it comes to you naturally. So <laughs> please share your secrets. <laughs> I appreciate it. No, it's, it's a great question. And, and you know, I'm so happy to be in the right place at the right time, you know, where where for the first time, I think people's perception of Blitz and perhaps Rapid, we can include in that category, which I also very much enjoy, uh, is changing, right? It used to be just something you did after a long tournament to pass the time or, you know, you, you were bored. So you logged on to ICC. Let's play some Blitz. Now, um, it's almost a, a career. It's, it's a different form of the game. And, you know, people can, people on my stream are sometimes like, well, when, when are you going to play real chess? Or like, when are you going to, you know, when are you going to stop the, the nonsense and go play a classical tournament? And I can talk about my reasons for taking a break from classical uh, in more depth. And I'm essentially semi-retired from classical, but I'm not retired from chess. And I push back on that very strongly. I think that's a ridiculous statement um, because I spend e each day, every day in chess. And I play tr tons of Blitz, and I'm very serious about improving at Blitz. My dream is one day, you know, to challenge Hikaru and, you know, Magnus and, and the other greats of Blitz, essentially Magnus and Hikaru, uh, for, like, Blitz supremacy. I want to eventually reach their level. Um, that's a very ambitious goal. And, uh, of course, it, it has occurred to me that perhaps I just lack the classical chess strength and the chess strength, period, uh, to even contend for that. Um, so it's a lofty ambition, but I think I'm moving in the right direction. And I think that 
even as my classical rating has remained the same for you know a couple of years now, uh, my cross 2600, I think in 2015, uh, I feel like my blitz level based just on my rating progress has improved very, very substantially. And that is because I have done things uh, in large part, this is just playing copy tens, hundreds of thousands of games, uh, but also things that I have done to train uh, my blitz ability specifically. So I'm not a retired player. I'm, I may be a retired classical player, but I am most certainly not a retired blitz and bullet player. And, and finally, I think people are taking that type of approach a little bit more seriously. I'm never going to claim, uh, nor have I ever claimed that blitz is somehow equivalent to classical in its in its in its closeness to the true form of chess, right, or to the essence of chess. Um, but again, I don't even like that type of thinking. Who cares? Like, why do we even need to have this argument? Like, what? It, it, it's not a zero sum game. Blitz and classical can coexist. They're different forms of the game. Um, yes, classical is the truer form of chess. Okay, happy. Um, I, <laughs> I'm happy to admit that. Um, but I, I'm at an age where I do things because you know we only live once and. I'm not, I just enjoy Blitz more than Classical. And, and that's why I play more Blitz than Classical. Um, I don't feel like I have anything left to prove in the realm of Classical Chess. I achieved my lifelong dream of 2600. I traveled the world and I've kind of, uh, I'm onto different things. So in terms of what I do to train, what I have done to train, again, in large part, this is just playing insane amounts of games, particularly these long matches against Hikaru, and uh, some of the other Blitz greats on, on, on chess.com, Ali Reza, um, we used to play all the time, not just Bullet, but also long three-minute matches. Uh, and, and some of the top players on chess.com, that has helped me more than anything because uh, to, to zero in on my matches with Hikaru, he has taught me through our matches so many things that I was not doing at all. And by implementing those things, sometimes there's a period where you force yourself to implement them and your rating drops. Mm -hmm. And you start disbelieving in, okay, this is not for me. But eventually, if you're stubborn and you truly believe that this is a positive change in your play, it's going to help. And, and it's going to uh, integrate itself into your style. Let me give you a few examples. Yeah, I want you to ask for First examples. First of all, the biggest thing I did, and I think I included it in that Blitz article I wrote for chess.com a couple of years ago. Uh, I did a quick study of some of Hikaru's Blitz games. And I found that in the vast majority of his games, um, it, he thinks for 15 seconds, let's take three plus zero. He, t he thinks for 15 seconds or more, like usually once per game, like exactly once per game, he takes a think of 15 seconds or more, sometimes twice, but very rarely three times or more. So he plays incredibly fast. What, what does that mean? Does that mean he pre-moves a lot? No, it means like a lot of his moves are made, uh, particularly in the middle game, in sort of like three to five seconds. So I... In, if you compare me to like other top blitz players, I try to play fast in general. Um, and I try to play very, very fast in complex positions, uh, which at first produced that drop because I would blunder a lot. But then I kind of realized how to do this properly. If you take five to 10 to 10 seconds, uh, you can usually blunder check pretty effectively. This, Greg, I think is, is where I rely on my perhaps biggest blitz strength, which is quick recognition, again, of short tactics. Like I tend to blunder check pretty reliably. I don't blunder a lot in blitz. Um, and when I take five to 10 seconds, I can calculate uh, quite a few short variations to ensure that I'm not making big blunders. Um, I also think I have a pretty good tactical intuition. So when I go for a sacrifice, uh, people assume that I've calculated everything. Usually, no. Um, it's that I've spent that time trying to assess the likelihood that my opponent will deal with the problems that I've posed uh, in the time that that, that he has left to spend. And Hikaru is so good at this. Like he almost never goes for unsound sacks. Um, his play in Blitz is incredibly solid, but when he does go for sacks, uh, they're almost always well thought out. His pieces end up on the right squares at the right time. So by forcing myself to play faster throughout the game, um, I'm also relying on my other strength, of course, which is just a uh, time scramble ability. So often when I enter these time scrambles, I've got just a few seconds more than my opponent, which allows me to win so many games by flagging. Yes, I win a lot of games by flagging. Again, happy, happy to, to admit that. Um, what are some other things? Uh, openings. The other big thing is I trusted the traditional wisdom that openings are not important in Blitz, right? This is kind of how I thought of it initially, 
what you play in Blitz uh, doesn't matter because ultimately the game is not going to be decided in the opening. And people listening might say, yeah, you just said that. You gave the example of Gukesh's B4, right? And how in Blitz, uh, these decisions are not that important. But here's the subtle difference. In the early middle game, these small positional decisions are not important at all. But actually, the opening that you play, the first three or four moves, are incredibly important. And one thing that has changed my level entirely, and I think this is responsible for my rise. If you take my chess.com blitz rating, I was hovering around 2,900, uh, 3,000 for a long time. And now I have, again, I have drops. Um, I have bad periods, but usually I'm around 3,100 to 3,150. Uh, that rise, I think, is because I I carefully tailored an opening repertoire specifically to Blitz. I went through my openings and figured out what what openings maximize my ability in Blitz, which which is to say, get the types of positions that allow me to bring out my strengths. With White, I essentially eliminated all moves except one e four, and I tried to take the position into the territory of tactical middle games, particularly with an open center. Um, and avoid long mainstream theory that has always been my weakness in classical too. So for instance, Alapin against C5, I almost play exclusively. Against E4, E5, um, I play the Glex system, uh, four knights with G3, which is almost never played at the GM level. And my results are, are insane because I've analyzed it, it, not deeply, but enough so that I understand the basic ideas. And this is what people don't understand. Um, this is what Jospam uh, does so well, by the way. Mm -hmm. Sorry to... Again, I'm not bringing him up for any reason other than to say, if you look at his games, he plays the same stuff over and over again, and it's not theoretically challenging. If you run it on Stockfish, uh, he plays variations that are not going to beat Gukesh in Classical. They're just like dead equal, or sometimes white is even slightly worse. But that's not the point. He's studied the typical ideas in the middle game, so he's able to play really, really fast. And because he's a more positional player, he's chosen openings that tend to get the types of positions, the types of structures that he's just more confident in. And because he's played a million games in those structures, you actually start getting really like uncannily good at playing fast and relatively accurately in certain middle games. So a narrow opening repertoire which is carefully chosen and suited to your strengths, is a huge game changer, I think, at all levels in Blitz, uh, but especially at sort of the higher levels. But this is very much applicable also to um, people who are passionate about getting better and are not titled. Choose your openings carefully and your Blitz repertoire, if you're an active classical player, can have nothing to do with your classical repertoire. Um, with Black, I now play the Alakine against D4 in classical um, I, I play e4, e5. In Blitz, I almost never play e4, e5. Um, in Classical, I play 1d4 and 1 knight f3. And in Blitz, I almost never play those moves. I play 1e4 almost exclusively. Um, same with the Jababa London. So openings mm -hmm. are much more important in Blitz. And even in Bullet than people realize, those are like two really, really big things. And of course, also just integrating feedback. If I lose uh, a match by, by many points, if I find an opponent that I struggle against in Blitz, I try to figure out why. Uh, because at my level, I basically play the same people. So if somebody has my number, um, and it, it, that, that shouldn't happen rating-wise, like with Hikaru, I lose to him because he's Hikaru. Um, with someone like David Paravian, I really struggle against him in Blitz. And I try to ask myself, what are the things he does that cause me to struggle? And I identify certain factors, and that kind of just tells me, okay, those are my big weaknesses. This is what I need to try to improve over time in Blitz. And uh, the biggest thing, of course, just experience, playing consistently, and uh, I'm not trying to justify my Blitz addiction here, but I guess I am. <laughs> well, <laughs> this addiction uh, has turned into a great career and uh, exciting stuff to watch for uh, hundreds of thousands or even millions of people uh, worldwide. So <laughs> I think that's enough justification for this <laughs> for this addiction. By the way, it's a great uh, a great place to remind uh, the audience that you have some opening courses on some of the openings that you mentioned. So we'll give the links in the description for everyone interested to to uh, update their open 
openings for Blitz as well. I think that might be useful for many. Okay, uh, uh, but what exactly is it uh, that you are working on currently? You, you mentioned that you you uh, study your games with uh, uh, opponents that you might struggle against, and you notice something, mm -hmm. some patterns that you maybe lack understanding of certain structures or certain things. What are those those things, mm -hmm. and uh, how exactly are you working on them currently? If you can, uh, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. uh, tell about this. Yeah. Well, obviously, I'll, I'll c contextualize this by saying that I've, I, I've, I wear many hats, hats and I don't have nearly as much time as I would have liked to, to systematically work on my, my own Blitz improvement. I mean, that is not my priority right now, given that I'm doing a chessable course on, on the King's Indian, uh, which is extremely helpful, by the way, right? Working on an opening course, it teaches me so many ideas. It Uh, when you're working on an opening course, you're invested tactically, like you're analyzing. And the pro this is, I think, something people really don't understand about analysis, just like analyzing whether it's a game or an opening helps you generally, right? It keeps you sharp. And the ideas that you learn, yeah, maybe you want to apply that particular queen a5 maneuver in a different position in your blitz games, but uh, it just gets you uh, into the right frame of mind. As far as like my targeted targeted work, I do tactics. So I definitely do pretty regular solving. I also teach uh, not nearly as much as I used to, but um, I, I work with a few higher rated students and uh, we solve together. Oftentimes like we will, uh, I will set up a position and I, I don't see the solution and we will spend five, 10 minutes thinking about it together. Um, I think this is an underutilized approach by coaches, not just because Uh, I need to get off my ass sometimes, and but because it's it's inspirational for the student to 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 see me also struggling with these positions, and uh, I feel like I have to bring my A game. So those lessons really really help me because I'm I'm super locked in. Honestly, I think the biggest thing is learning uh, by by doing. It's like those uh, I'm so technically illiterate, but uh, like Leela or or self learning. Uh, engines, right? They start out by hanging all their pieces and then they pull themselves up by the bootstraps. From a layman's perspective, that's a fascinating, fascinating process. I mean, there's all these terms that are thrown around. I'm sure it makes sense to uh, a, a software engineer or someone more more literate in this sphere, you know, Monte Carlo simulation and, you know, neural networks mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, machine learning algorithm. So all these buzzwords are thrown out, but let me approach this more philosophically. And a computer Um, a, a system that teaches itself how to play and within like uh, uh, milliseconds essentially reaches uh, a level never before attained even by another engine uh, like Alpha Zero. I mean, that's just uh, mind boggling to me. But it, I would say that that process occurs when you play as much as I do in Blitz. It's not that I consciously will go over all of my Blitz games from a certain session, but I think almost subliminally when I lose this, uh, a game in the same type of way, So certain things are eventually integrated into my play. For example, um, this happens in the opening, like uh, I'll lose in the same line twice or three times, and then I'll start playing a different line and, and do better. But with certain like larger decisions, uh, I stopped sacrificing as many pieces, I think <laughs> over the last year or so in, in Blitz. Um, I realized that in, in many cases, I was overcomplicating a process and trying to completely dodge quiet positions Uh, which against stronger opponents led to a lot of games where I would just crash and burn. I sacrificed a knight uh, or something in an early middle game and people have gotten faster, right? On average, even players of the older generation who still like to play Blitz online, everybody learned how to use a mouse during COVID, okay? Uh, except maybe some, some people. <laughs> everybody can checkmate with queen and king versus king with five seconds left. So those techniques that I used to apply where I would just like, go into an endgame down a queen because my opponent had 15 seconds, that does not work anymore at all. So I've had to make my decisions a little bit more objectively. And particularly this happens when I try to kind of go into flagging, right? I mean, I will only try to directly flag someone essentially if they're under 30 seconds. Um, so by trying to play a little bit more objectively, I'm milking more time off my opponent's clock and uh, I'm allowing my Uh, time strengths to, to, to work for me. Um, but a lot of these, Greg, to be honest, are, are more, uh, they're decisions that can't always be just categorized. Like, oh, I've started to trade less queens or I've started to trade more queens or I've started to push pawns more in the end game. Like, I wouldn't be able to quantify the things that I have 
uh, improved on and implemented in that way, unless I did like a, a very deep systematic study of my games, which is actually maybe something that I should eventually do and, and publish my findings. But things like that, um, through the process of playing and playing and playing, um, in Blitz, you just play, the quantity of games you play is much greater than in Classical because people might wonder like, okay, so why isn't everybody in Classical chess just like automatically 2,800? Well, you're not playing hundreds of thousands of Classical games, mm -hmm. but that is the benefit of Blitz, that the volume of data that you receive is so great um, that if you do that consistently, you're just going to automatically start implementing certain things. And uh, this is a big problem, I think, with adult improvers, just to conclude uh, th this answer. Um, when I've worked with adult students, uh, there's a certain stubbornness that I see, which I found uh, difficult to work with sometimes in the sense that, uh, okay, they'll say, well, I've been stuck at 1600 blitz for uh, rapid for the two years, and I want to improve my chess.com rapid rating. Okay, so I, I look at some of their games, and for example, they're playing the same bad opening for, for an entire year, losing all of their games in it. And I'm like, well, well, John, you know, why are you playing this opening when you just told me that you hate positional play, but you keep playing the Karo Khan with black and you don't like cramped positions, but your knights are on E7 and D7. Well, I read in the chessable course that it was a good opening. And it's like people are beholden to these rules with a capital R that they read about and feel like they can't blaze their own path, which is a little bit shocking to me. You should play what you like. I get this question a lot on my stream. Is X a good opening for my level? Yeah. <laughs> try it and see what your results are, okay? It's, it's like they try to predict what they're going to like, and once they choose something, that's it. You can't change. And the same goes for the middle game. Like, a lot of times, you have to take ownership of your improvement process, and figuring out why uh, you're losing games is honestly not as hard as I think some people think it is. Of course, if you're a beginner, it can be very overwhelming. I think a coach can be extremely useful in pointing out the things that you're systematically doing wrong. But I would give this advice to p people, particularly at the newer level, you play a game, um, go through it with the engine and see where the biggest mistakes were and ask yourself, well, what did I miss in this position? Why did I make this blunder? And the answer of oh, I made this blunder because I'm 1300, which is, I think, how some people approach it, is not uh, an acceptable attitude for improvement. You have to figure out as specifically as possible, okay, you blunder the knight. Why did you blunder the knight? Well, I didn't see the knight was hanging. Why didn't you see that the knight was hanging? Which piece is attacking the knight? Is it a queen that's located right next to the knight? Um, and maybe you didn't see that it was hanging because you were too worried about your attack on the other side of the board. Maybe you didn't see that it was hanging because literally the queen that was attacking it is on the other side of the board and nothing has happened on that side of the board for, for many moves. Was that knight hanging for a while or did something change in the position um, that you didn't notice that led to that blunder? For instance, I had a student uh, who was really bad at noticing uh, how pawn captures and trades impacted the position. Very common thing. Let's say a pawn, a black pawn from e6 takes a white pawn on d5. That opens up the e file, okay? And people have a hard time of integrating new data into the position, which is something I always emphasize in my speed run. Uh, how does every move change the, the data on the board, right? Maybe it's a pawn capture that opens a diagonal. You have to be very obsessive about monitoring every single move and the, and the small impacts that it makes, which I think will make a huge difference in your ability to quickly scan the board and detect blunders. But I'm going off on a tangent here. Uh, I want to let you uh, take steer the conversation in, in, in the direction that you want. Well, that was definitely very, uh, very educational. Uh, I hope that our viewers and listeners not just listen to this, but take this in and try to, to use this knowledge in their games. Uh, because uh, you should listen to this guy. He's, he knows a couple of things about chess. <laughs> uh, sure. Also, as we've just learned, uh, Daniel Noroditsky, Shocking Reveal, is a next generation uh, type of carbon-based uh, neural network that, uh, <laughs> that, that learns. <laughs> Damn it, Greg, I told you you should. You should wait until our next episode.
<laughs> yeah, to reveal uh, that. Yeah. I definitely hope there will be a next one because uh, there are lots of topics that I would love to discuss with you. Uh, and to, we, we will not be able to uh, put this all into one podcast. Uh, but I want to end on a classical uh, note that uh, uh, I uh, use uh, when my guest uh, agrees. Uh, obviously, there is no pressure. If you don't want, you can refuse. But I uh, usually ask my grandmaster guests to play Blitz with me, giving me some time odds so that I could uh, at least have some tiniest chance of uh, <laughs> of winning or drawing the game. So uh, what do you say? I am more than happy. And I just wanted to say uh, I, I've enjoyed this conversation so much. And, and I think with, with podcasts, uh, it's, it's hard to cover a you know, wide range of topics because time flies. Uh, so fast if, if the questions are good and the questions have been great. So I think that, you know, once we put this out, if people could tolerate my, my, my rambling and, and long tangents and they were into it, I'm so, you know, I would be happy to do a second and maybe even a third part if, if you're, of course, uh, interested. So, so no pressure. I, I totally get it. Uh, but, you know, we can delve deep, more deeply into the topic of, of chess education and, and my approach mm-hmm. to the speed run and, uh, my, my path as a chess educator. Um, that could be an interesting thing to dedicate our, our second conversation to, but I'd be more than happy. Maybe we should wait for the reception and, uh, and, and take yeah. it from there, but more than happy to play an odds game with you. Um, I might get my ass whooped, but <laughs> we can, uh, I, doubt, I, do I, doubt it. I doubt it. Okay, guys. So I'm waiting for your 1000 comments under this YouTube video. Once <laughs> there's 1000 comments, we make the second episode. I think that would be a fair, a fair deal. Okay. Uh, what kind of odds, uh, would, would, would be, would be okay for you because it's online offline. I've played mm. Fabi one minute against five, but, uh, online one mm-hmm. with one minute, you will destroy me, <laughs> wipe me off the board. So maybe like 30 seconds or we something do- like that. 30 seconds against three or 30 seconds against five is perfect. Which should, do you want to do chess com or lead chess? Well, chess com, I think is fine. Uh, also, okay. for, since you are the <laughs> ambassador for, for this platform <laughs> and I, I, I like I appreciate it very it. much. So yeah, let's do chess com. This is another topic we should talk because it's not talked mm-hmm. about enough, if I may. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, like I'm, I'm team chess.com, uh, in the sense that I'm, you know, I'm the lead commentator. I, 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 I don't make any bones about that. I, I think chess.com, um, as far as companies go, is, is not the company that people should necessarily like hate on. Um, and I think it does, it is misunderstood in some ways. So I am a big fan of, of what chess.com does. And I don't think there's a single person on earth who would deny that the online ecosystem we have today, is it perfect? No right? Is chess.com perfect? Very far from it. And if you listen to my stream, you'll know that I, I really don't hold back uh, if I mm-hmm. think there's something to criticize. But a lot of it is due to the, to the efforts of chess.com. At the same time, I really wish that, that this meme of like a Lee Chess versus chess.com or like, I can't say the word Lee Chess during a broadcast. <laughs> yes, I can. You know, Lee Chess, Lee Chess, Lee Chess. So I don't, yeah, chess.com is going to come. Danny Wrench is now at my door knocking. Danya, you're fired. No. <laughs> and, and I think that we need to move past that juvenile approach. So I use Lee Chess, for example, for my, my chess lessons, and it's, it's an amazing site. Um, I love Lee Chess, and, and chess.com has some things that it needs to work on, where, where Lee Chess is the trailblazer. Okay, I said it. It doesn't mean that I my allegiances are not with chess.com. I, I love to commentate for them. They treat me well, and I want to be part of of, of the uh, cutting edge, you know, the, the frontiers of online chess uh, and the, the site and the company that makes uh, new kind of keeps advancing that sphere and, and chess.com is that place to be. So sorry for the rant, Greg. We, we don't have to include this, but I just, just wanted to clarify for people that I'm mm-hmm. a chess player. Um, my soul has not been sold yet as far as I know um, and probably never will. So I really wish that we could all just uh, let that simmer down a little bit. There doesn't have to be that bitter rivalry between sites and mm-hmm. uh, maybe a topic, a spicy topic for the next episode. Yeah, yeah, we'll include it definitely. By the way, I love chess.com. I think the, the awesome. team is doing a great job. I, I think it's, it's the best company in the world of chess right now, without a question. So there may be some problems sometimes, but uh, it doesn't uh, cancel the fact that I mentioned. Uh, so uh, I need to make the second one, right? Nope, I actually can add time. Okay. Here we go. I play the Alakine just like I promised. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Sorry. Is... Okay, thanks. There we go. Let... You ready? Luck. 
Okay, let's go. Yes. The four pawns. <laughs> uh, that's right. I have to remember what I should do here. Okay, uh, I think this. This. Uh, uh, this. This. Uh -huh. oh, I must read her gambit. Mix. I mixed mixed up, <laughs> mixed up. You got what time. Doing. Take. I yeah. feel like when I play odds games, you you should take your time because it's so easy just to play fast in response. But play at your own pace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it might be too late. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it was not uh, the opening that decision that I that I like. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Didn't think that was legal, did you? I completely <laughs> forgot. The likewise, is so in this chest. That's a right common 16. one, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. A stupid. stupid. Taking, a, <laughs> taking a page out of out of Fisher Random Book. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. but still, it's interesting. Okay. Um. Maybe I can sacrifice like Daniel Nerodiski. <laughs> I don't know if that's a if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> I wouldn't advocate for it. Ooh, this is nasty. Ooh, oh, <laughs> another Daniel Nerodiski sacrifice. <laughs> that was uh -oh. not. <laughs> Do you want? Do you want that move back? I I don't know if I can. Uh, give you I a think, back think uh, it's it's not uh, it would not be right. Uh, okay, you have eleven seconds. I think that would be enough for you in this position. But <laughs> let's try. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's still an attack. It's still an attack. Okay. You already started pre-moving. <laughs> or Close is to that. it just? Mm -hmm. I was anticipating knight b5. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. It seems that my attack has died down. It's just stage but one. I, you just have to bring your forces back and regroup I, for the I next have, one. I have my <laughs> forces here. <laughs> my kitten <laughs> came to help me. Oh, nice. Okay. I, I really, oh my god, so cute. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Okay, now it's Good pretty much style. pretty much hopeless. <laughs> but uh, I'll try seconds. to play on. No, you have to. Yeah, professional. <laughs> okay, I resign. Uh -huh. That was <laughs> that was a demonstration Good of game class. That was scary. <laughs> no, by you. I actually missed e6 on move uh, 15, and when I spotted it, I, I think I'm lost. I think I'm dead lost, actually. But I didn't see the forced win after queen c7. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, apparently rook a to e1. And by the way, like I don't mean to make an educational moment out of this. I, I, I need I need education you know, from you. I don't like, give, me, give me your lesson, please. <laughs> right now. <laughs> so knight f so the move knight knight f seven mm -hmm. um 
is a very tempting move. I mean, Rook F7 was also tempting, but then I take your knight. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a, a very important blitz skill that's not talked about enough is the ability to like quickly understand when you should try to go in for the kill yeah. and when a slower buildup move is necessary. And understanding that intuitively is... Uh, is very, very important. That's a big game changer. So my instinct there would be to go Rook A to E1. Mm. Because it's kind of clear that Black, like the big thing is Black can't castle on the next move or even on the move after that because you're controlling D8 and F8. So Black's King is stuck in the center. Yeah. And it's th that is why a move like Rook A to E1, a lot of people would rule it out because like you've sacrificed a few pawns, but that doesn't exclude a slower move. Once the knight is defended, you can go queen d3 to h3 or knight c3 to b5. There, or rook f7 is a huge threat, actually. It just wins mm -hmm. my queen. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm lost there. You uh, you completely outplayed me. Well, uh, it was by luck. <laughs> but in the end, as it usually happens, the, the class, the skill showed. So uh, thank you very much. It was very educational for me as well. Uh, and I hope for our viewers and listeners, next time I will... Uh, train more and play more blitz. I don't play too much blitz online. That's 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 not my best uh, uh best good. forte, so I will work on that. <laughs> good, good, good. Thank you very much no, again. I, I play enough for everybody in the universe. Uh, Greg, uh, listen, this was amazing. The time flew by and uh I I want to just apologize to anybody for my answers if they were rambly or it is still post candidates hangover. I'm uh, you know, I'm still really, really kind of mentally drained from it. So I did my best, but if people enjoyed it, I certainly did. Your questions are probably the best that I've seen, not just to me, but to Fabian, to Levon, truly of any chess podcast uh, or show that I've seen. And uh, it's a great pleasure. I would be honored to hop on for a part two soon enough. Okay, great pleasure for me as well. Great answers. Uh, waiting for 1,000 comments, guys. You need to, to do your best to do that. And see you in the next Thank one. You, Greg. Subscribe to Daniel. All his uh, links to his resources are in the description. And stay tuned for further videos and podcasts. Bye-bye.